In 1975, in the Philippines, two warriors, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, had already fought a bitter head-to-head -head contest. Three years after the thriller in Manila, Karpov and Korchnoi were to fight the Battle of Baguio. It wasn't just the ideological battle, it was a major clash of personalities. Korchnoi and Karpov hated each other, they loathed each other. Just a clear demonstration of KGB dirty tricks. Victor had no doubts he would be assassinated. So if you were going to write a movie script, you couldn't have done it better. spying on me ever since I landed at the airport. Everywhere I go, they spy on me. Everywhere I go, they spy on me. The whole Red Army against me. Chess has been viewed since Stalin's time as, the, as an intellectual tool to demonstrate the, the superiority, intellectual superiority of communist regime over the decadent West. In the Soviet Union, there was a number of things that the society prized above many others. Poetry, ballet, chess. These three areas that the Soviets absolutely prided themselves in, invested billions of rubles in the West were virtually overlooked. The Soviets weren't interested in chess per se. They were interested in winning. It was a part of propaganda. Chess was held in such high esteem and there was this system of uh, what was called pioneer houses in every district of a large city and in smaller cities as well. There would be a pioneer house with a chess coach. They had the best books, they had the best trainers, they had the best tournaments and it all led to, to this Soviet chess school. After the Second World War, they changed the title amongst themselves. It was internal business. And while the rest of the world admired their chess, there was nothing much more we could do about it. Champion of the world was Mikhail Batvinnik, Vasily Smyslov, Mikhail Tal, Tigran Petrosyan, Boris Spassky. This was this intellectual prize that the Soviets possessed and they absolutely were determined to keep it. Which is why all the people who were in control in the Soviet Union, in, in, in the Soviet Chess Federation, were not chess players. They were people from the party, from the KGB. If they think you, you didn't perform up to your potential, uh, they could punish you by many different ways. It just happened silently and nobody would object or complain because to object or complain would be dangerous. There was a tradition in Soviet chess of failure being punished and when Tarmanov lost 6-0 to Fischer he had all sorts of state privileges withdrawn. In 1972, Bobby Fischer, Boris Baskey meet. It's the capitalist, the communist, the Cold War. Fischer was really the lonesome hero of the West, fighting against the whole system. Fischer lost the first game due to an inexplicable blunder and blamed the whirring sound of nearby cameras for his loss. When he failed to appear for the second game because he wanted the cameras removed, the KGB sent Boris Baskey a telegram ordering him to return to Moscow. The KGB wanted to abandon the match and retain the World Championship title. Spassky, however, refused the KGB's order. When Fischer returned to play and win the third game, the Soviets had lost the off-the-board contest. Spassky then went on to lose the match and the World Chess Championship.
losing the match to an American, almost a hippie-like player, an individual, that was a big blow to the Soviet authorities. When Spassky lost to Fisher, he found himself feeling very uncomfortable in the USSR. We had the rule actually, that uh, the prices were not taxed. And so Spassky received full amount, which was uh, for even for leaders of the country, it was a huge amount. And then he was not very modest, and uh, so he, he created waves against him. The Russians really learned from their loss to Fisher. They decided that you could no longer take prisoners. Six years later, the world's press would again be camped at another World Chess Championship. But this time, its roots were in another war. The Second World War and the siege of Leningrad, where a young Viktor Korchnoi faced starvation and death every day. In 1937, his father touched him to play chess. He was six years old. His father died in the Russian army in November 1941, and he was very often alone. God knows where his mother was, and sometimes his stepmother went to the death uh, relatives of the family just to take the coupons for bread. He was starving there, and uh, no doubt it had very big impact on him. It's very hard, if not simply impossible, to separate Victor the person from Victor the chess competitor because he lived for chess. He could not live without chess. He could not even breathe without chess. It was everything. It was water, oxygen. He, and without that, he would probably die. When he wrote, chess is my life, that basically summed it up. He had in life uh, only chess. He had some other interests, but still, the main interest, 100% was chess. He also found it a bit confusing that other people didn't, you know, weren't quite as passionate about chess as he was. Victor consumed vast amounts of time trying to find the, the best move. And during that time, his senses are like a Ferrari in fifth gear. What Kortnoy did is to show that is a fight. It doesn't matter if you're better or worse. He liked chaos. It was, in his, in his hands, it was probably controlled chaos, but it was still chaos. He would accept bad positions for the sheer mental energy of solving the problem and getting out of it and perhaps even winning. Korshner belongs to a small group of uh, big chess players, but Winnik needed to hate the open. And uh, Korshner was a clear follower of Winnik. One of Korshner's nicknames was Victor the Terrible. He was so provocative. For him, chess definitely was a form of psychological warfare. Like a dragon or something could be very quiet, but as soon as you would tickle him, then a fire coming from his mouth, steam coming out of his ears. I mean, he was huffing and puffing and, and smacking the pieces down on the board. I have played Korchner many times, and I've been irritated by him the same number of times I've played him. I managed to beat him, and he shook my hand with absolute disgust and disdain, you know. Everything about his body language said, how can I lose to you? He was a very bad loser. When he was losing the game, he started insulting his opponent. He said, what is it? And I said, well, I'm a pawn up. He said, pawns, pawns are for schoolboys. He looked at me and he said, young man, you're a very superficial chess player and I could have beaten you if I wanted. Korchnoi played Mohammed al Mudiaki, the Qatari Grandmaster, and he leant across the board and said, do you speak English? To which he replied, yes. He said, then why don't you resign? <laughs> How can you say something like this? Even, even to your worst enemy, you don't interrupt his thinking. Sometimes what the course went too far, but it's because of, because of his passion. Destroying whoever was sitting in front of him was very much part of it. But I thought it was a badge of honor. Viktor Korchnoi, the terrible, indeed. But everything for his chess career, he could sacrifice everything for that. He became a member of Communist Party. 
in 1965. And uh, the other grandmasters, or a lot of other grandmasters, they didn't. If you think of any adjective to, to describe Victor, think of the opposite adjective and you've probably got Karpov. Anatoly Karpov, or Tolya as he was affectionately nicknamed, was 20 years younger. He was also a child of the new post-Stalin Russia, under Khrushchev. He had very good first trainer. It was maybe always replacement of father. It was Mr. Furman. When he came onto the scene, Anatoly Karpov played with remarkable speed. There was no one like him. 1970, he becomes world junior champion. 1971, he wins along with Leonard Stein his first super tournament being only 20 years old. 1973, he shares with Scorch in the first second in an interzonal tournament. New star is born. No one could really touch him during that time. You know, he just dominated the chess world. He was the ideal sort of Soviet citizen, like the first cosmonauts, someone like this. People had posters of him on their wall at home, boys and girls. From a very young age, he was in the front yard of this communist youth movement. He just always played this role of our boy. Harpo was a loyal soldier of the Communist Party. He found it more accommodating to be loyal and to sort of receive all the benefits of the superstar. I don't know whether Karpov was KGB agent, but I'm pretty sure he was a faithful son uh, of his motherland. He's been called the Iceman. He's cool, calculated, avoids risk wherever he can. When I've been interviewing Karpov during a tournament, you have to struggle a little bit to, to get a good soundbite out of him. Stylistically, they said he's a dull player. I don't think he was dull at all. In a way, Magnus Carlsen play now reminds me very much young Karpov. He had unprecedented feeling for how to put pieces on the board. He'd play a few moves and you'd play a few moves and then suddenly you're a bit worse and you're not quite sure uh, how it happened. Karpov is not even so, so interested in his own plan, but he will keep on foiling yours. You give him a chance, he immediately grabs a chance. Whatever happened one move ago, he doesn't care. So he starts playing from the scratch. This is kind of a machine-like quality. Even when he was very short on time, not only good moves, it was the best moves. When you get into very unusual schemes, he can lose his orientation. Most famous example is Tony Miles. In Skara in 1980, he played 1A6, which is one of the most embarrassing moves on the chessboard. And he beat Karpov. And Karpov didn't even mind the loss. He, he was offended at the opening. It's normal when you discuss a game, you try and find out what is the truth of the position. But for Karpov, this had no relevance. What he wanted to do was to show his superiority. The way Karpov behaved off the board to gain a little advantage or psychological advantage against his opponents, that was just Karpov. If you ever start to underestimate him, you do so at your peril. Having successfully qualified through the 1973 candidates tournament, both Karpov and Korchnoi were now through to the quarter-finals of the knockout match system, but their disagreement in the last round at Leningrad was the start of their bitter rivalry. So we were leading, and then we came with the same number of points to the last round, and then Korchnoi approached me, and he said, tomorrow we play last round, we both qualified, but you understand I played better this tournament, so it would not be correct if you win the tournament. That's why I offer two draws. You make draw with uh, Tore, and then I make draw with Hübner, he will agree. And then I said, Victor, I don't understand. We played nice tournament. Why should I offer draw on Tore? Who wins tomorrow? That will be the winner of the tournament. And so I beat Tore very quick, maybe 21, 22 moves. And then Korishnoi had to suffer, then there were applauses. And so we realized Korishnoi won the game. And Korishnoi was passing me and then he said, you forced me to beat Hübner. <laughs> As Korchnoi and Karpov started their cycle of matches to decide who would challenge Fischer for the World Championship in 1975, the young Karpov had already decided that it was unlikely that he would beat Fischer. I said, this is not my cycle. And uh, so I thought maybe 
uh, I had lack of experience uh, of matches, first of all. But then I crushed uh, Pulogayevsky. And then with Spassky, I had some physical preparations on the Baltic Sea, which is very cold, and on the ice. And then it was strong wind, and I got sick, I had a fever. And then I called organizers and I said, let's postpone. They said, but you know, we invited so many people, so this is a big event. And so I couldn't postpone the first game, I had to play ill. I started with a loss with white pieces, and after this, I beat Spassky uh, four games almost in a row. Beating Spassky 1974, which I think was one of the peaks of Karpov's career, Spassky played much better than in Reykjavik, and he still lost. After this match with Spassky, I made fantastic preparation. I changed my openings. I thought now I can fight for world champion. When Karpov and Korchnoi won through to the final, it already looked likely that Fischer wouldn't play either of them. The final of the candidates' match was now increasingly looking as though it could decide the world champion himself. Then he approached each person in press center, and we had many mutual friends, and he said, we meet with Karpov in the final, and now you must choose with whom you continue your relations, with me or with Karpov. Is it not strange? And so many people, even old friends of Korchnoi, they were surprised and they told me what is strange behavior. The Soviets had really made the decision. Anatoly is going to be a challenger to Bobby Fischer. If anyone could fight against Fischer, uh, it could be Karpov because he was younger than Fischer. With Korchnoi, we were in very good terms. We did mutual preparation before in 71 and 72. But in 74, he was complaining officials were not on his side. But he did everything. Officials should be on my side. <laughs> Victor says it at the start of one of his books. I was no wunderkind. I was no wonder child. Whereas Karpov, his talent was one of the biggest in the history of chess. So he was given everything. Officials wanted to, to have this match in Moscow. But that time we both lived in Leningrad. He said that he would prefer to play in Leningrad, and I was not against. And then I said, okay, let's uh, make agreement. I want to play at five o'clock, and this was only my condition. And so I went to Minister of Sport. He said, okay, if you both want to play in Leningrad, what, what to do? Play in Leningrad. This was a, a fascinating clash of styles. It almost was like their personalities as well, because Karpov was quite reserved. Whereas Korchnoi, he likes to put himself out there. He likes to provoke people. The first minute I enter my apartment, telephone, Korchnoi, he said, I don't agree to start our games at five o'clock. I would insist to start at three. And he, he knew quite well that I'm a late bird. And then I said, Victor, we agreed with uh, uh, witness uh, your close friend and my close friend. Immediately I ran to ministry. I said, we can play Tbilisi, we can play Yerevan, <laughs> we can play Kyiv, Moscow. And then he said, but we want you to play Moscow. I said, anywhere but not Leningrad. And then he said, if the question doesn't know how to keep the word, then my position will be you play in Moscow and we start the games at five o'clock. And from this, question I said, okay, Officials are on the Karpov side. The system was really behind Anatoly Karpov. They are shouting, smash him, well done, Tola, smash him, Tola. All the shots which are made by the Soviets, very artificial, because I am always thinking at the board. He's playing quickly, well, he's genius, I'm working hard. Korchnoi eventually lost the 24-game match by the slender margin of one point. But whereas Karpov had received the help of the best chess brains in Russia, Korchnoi felt that it was no coincidence that the top grand masters who wanted to help him, such as previous world champion Vasily Smyslov and challenger David Bronstein, had been sent away from Moscow for six weeks. They both returned to Moscow after the match had finished. 
It was unfair conditions. Top, top grandmasters wanted to help Korchnoi. And they had to do it surreptitiously with phone calls in the middle of the night from pay phones so that the KGB couldn't listen. At the end of the match, uh, Karpov weighed only 45 kilograms. This is a dangerous weight. Viktor Korchnoi could accept this loss and he made some bad remarks about Karpov, after which his career was in danger. He was talking about Karpov not being as a good player. Uh, someone who is just lucky. In communist time, yeah, you know, some comments uh, were not accepted. Korsnoy was made to suffer by the Soviet authorities. That would have built up this kind of bitterness and rancor against the Soviet system and against this one man, Karpov. When Korsnoy was punished for incorrect behavior and forbidden from traveling abroad to play chess, his bitter rival, former world champion Tugrin Petrosian, was the first to criticize him in the press and call for his punishment. Petrosian disqualified Korishnoi for one year. I was concentrated on my preparation with Fischer, and I didn't know what Federation did. Karpov was calculating. He had to steer his own path through this Soviet minefield. Only after he beat Korishnoi People started to believe that maybe he, he, he can beat Fischer. But Bobby wasn't playing. Bobby was mired in this incredible doomsday Christian cult. Bobby had his demons. Fischer couldn't make himself ready to play against Karpov. Karpov was a player that Fischer didn't know, and Fischer was always afraid of something that he didn't know. Karpov didn't have the chance to uh, beat Fischer, so he had to prove himself as a world champion in some other way, and he managed to do that. He was quite impressive. He won almost every tournament he played. He was the first world champion who really was not afraid to face challenges. After Karpov had won back the World Chess Championship, the restrictions on Korchnoi were lifted. To the sports committee, Korchnoi was just a troublesome yesterday man. Korchnoi realized that he wouldn't be able to win the title while staying in the Soviet Union. Chess professionals were not, you know, independent contractors. They all were paid by the state. Their trips to the West were sanctioned by the state. The state provides you with all life opportunities. And in return, it demands 100% conformity. Viktor Korchnoi repeated many times I like to decide myself where I'm going, when I'm going, which tournament I'm uh, playing, and not the sport committee who is deciding for me. The Soviet Union, you know, it is not, not allowed to travel normally, like uh, it is uh, in, in the Western, in the free world. And so Viktor Korchnoi realized that the only way to continue his profession was to leave the Soviet Union. Impossible doesn't seem to be a word that's recognized any longer by determined escapers with friends on the other side. In the beginning of 1976, in January, Victor and me we played in Hastings. To obtain this visa, Koishno needed some support, and so I gave him guarantee that he can go and nothing happens. We were walking, discussing only one problem. How for Victor is easier to leave Soviet Union? They will not give him a permission because he was one of the leading Soviet chess grandmasters. We met in Hastings and we drank whiskey the whole night. And he was very open. I gave him even some tip, where should he go? Most easier solution. Play in the tournament abroad and don't go back to the Soviet Union. But you understand that after that, your family will be family of a traitor. Bella, the wife of Korchnoi, told me, well, you know, Mr. Hort, I am always afraid that somebody is even already watching us when we are going to the toilet. Half a year later, he came back to Amsterdam to play IBM tournament. Koch and I went to Tony Miles and he asked him, how do you spell political asylum? 
On the very last day, the taxi driver asked him, where were you going to, sir? And he told me, I didn't know. I didn't know what to say. Sir, where were you going to? Amsterdam, I said. He finally made that decision, and it came as quite a surprise for everyone. That was a terrible blow for the Soviet Union. Later on, he was saying that he didn't put me in the corner in difficult position because uh, he left country not during the first trip, but uh, during the second. <laughs> he wasn't a political animal. He simply wanted to play chess. But he wanted to play chess and be himself. And in the Soviet Union, that was not possible. Bella, his wife, Igor, his son, were literally trapped and stuck behind the Iron Curtain. We imagine uh, you will probably never see them anymore. The Soviets labeled him as a criminal. Judas of chess. He was given round the clock police guard by the Dutch police, well aware that the Soviets could come and take him out. Victor was a threat to the World Chess Championship. With absolute 100% certainty, Victor had no doubts he would be assassinated. When 14 people left the Soviet Union, they have a special aim, and they are preparing hostile activity against me. The Soviet press, typical for that time, tried to avoid mentioning Korsner by name. He was a persona non grata, and he was sort of airbrushed out of Soviet chess history. If they could drop his name, they did. Contender, challenger, Rarely, fortunately. So chess players between themselves started calling him villain. It's like <laughs> Voldemort, the name that cannot be mentioned. What Kochno did after he defected was quite effective. His chess blossomed after he left. As the candidates' matches for the 1978 World Championship approached, Viktor Korchnoi was still subject to a Soviet boycott. He could not play in any tournament in the Eastern Bloc, and no Soviet Bloc player would be sent to play in a Western tournament. The World Championship candidates' matches, however, were not subject to this boycott, and fate was to take an unusual turn. He played a match against Petrosan in the quarterfinal. He had a bitter rivalry with Petrosin, you know, kicking each other under the table and all kinds of stuff going on. He faced Lev Pologevsky, another very strong Soviet player, and he played Boris Spassky, former world champion, also from the Soviet Union. Spassky, who was married to a French lady who was a diplomat's daughter, was living in France. And for Victor, it was impossible for any Soviet to live outside the Soviet Union with the acquiescence of the Soviet system unless he was KGB. Even though Spassky was an emigre from the Soviet Union, Korsnoy grew to hate Spassky. This match was a remarkable roller coaster. Victor won a whole series of games, and then Spassky established his tactic of withdrawing from the stage, and he won a whole series of games back, and then Victor recovered his composure to win the match. Although World Championship matches are played between two players, each player has a small team of seconds comprised of world-class grandmasters. If they watch you in the tournament hall, for instance, they can say, your opponent made three moves fast, and I noticed that you lost it, you lost your cool. This sort of observation can be very useful because it is what decides games. When Batvinik played Bronstein or Smyslov or Tal or Spassky played Petrosian, they were teams already. But with Karpov, everything turned into machinery. Unfortunately, Furman, my main trainer, passed away half a year before the match. It was a big problem for me because I had to organize a new team. So I had to play a new role because I had to lead my team. The team was composed of Michael Tal, former world champion, Lev Pologaevsky, fantastic player and theoretician, Yuri Balashov, also a very strong player and profound theoretician, and Igor Zaitsev, the guy who was not such a strong player, but he had absolutely original ideas. It's not only having Tal and other leading players helping Anatoly Karpov, but also KGB using every dirty trick in the book. The leader of the Soviet delegation was the head of the Soviet Chess Federation, 
His name was Viktor Davidovich Batuinsky, who was a colonel in the KGB. He was very mighty. He was procurator already who signed the death warrant in Soviet system. Of course, he is infamous for his role in the Stalinistic days, but on the other hand, he was quite a good chess player, and he also had a, a very vast chess library, one of the biggest in the world. With a delegation of seconds, bodyguards, a psychologist, a personal chef, and KGB advisors and officials, Karpov's entourage was just short of 20 people. All were paid for by the Soviet state. He very often had a KGB man with him, Vladimir Pyshenko was his name. And Vladimir Pyshenko was somebody who was actually armed. He was responsible for life of Anatoly. I also got along with him quite well, but he was a terrible alcoholic. Karpov's official car crashed into a pine tree on a mountain road one night, and the first people on the scene found it empty. Anatoly car, where is Anatoly? In comparison, Korchnoi's delegation numbered just three seconds. Ray Keen was, uh, was known to be a very good uh, theoretician. And Steen was also uh, quite a strong player, a very promising player. I thought I could really help Korchnoi and the innovatory creativity that was permeating British chess at the time would be something that would give him added punch. I became kind of the rational voice. Ray Keane had this kind of slightly more presidential approach. Korchmar then wanted to add Yasha Mure, who I had doubts about. An ex-Soviet who had these wonderful flamboyant ideas. Very few of them ever worked, but the ones that did mattered. The one non-chess playing person in Viktor Korchnoi's delegation was Petra Leverich. With her Austrian-Dutch background, she became an implacable enemy of communism in the Soviet-controlled sector of Austria and Germany after World War II. Petra was an extraordinary woman of incredible energy, so loyal to Victor. She played chess as a hobby, and then she met Victor. And it was during the simultaneous exhibition in Zurich, and Victor had seen the, the book of Tolstoy in Russian language, and he asked, who is here uh, uh, reading Russian? Petra was virulently anti-communist. She had been a terrorist against the Soviets, literally fought against them and been arrested. She's from the Soviet part of Wien. And when she was 18, they took her and they put her in the prison. And after 10 years, 1956, she was released. Uh, in so-called Adenauer amnesty. Petra was his rock. He needed somebody to fall back on. Um, he needed emotional support. Um, and he needed somebody who understood what he had been through. You know, somebody who spent 10 years in the Soviet labor camp knows what it's like. She became uh, a bodyguard, manager, Housekeeper, secretary, girlfriend. Korchner had a very capable team behind him, but it's difficult to compare, you know, with, with a team led by, by Tyler. It was world champions against a bunch of amateurs. <laughs> it was no contest. When Karpov won the world champions title in 1975, he became only the 12th world champion since the contest began. Instead of the normal schedule of the best of 24 games, in Baggio, it was decided that the winner was to be the first person to win six games. In theory, this meant that the match had no definite end date. World Championship match, it's a crown jewel. There were only 16 world champions since the first official match in 1886. That tells you the value of the title. Competing World Championship is uh, different from psychological point of view because it's a big pressure on you. The pressure is enormous if you have to play such matches. And constant pressure, actually, for, uh, for years. From an emotional point of view, when I lost to Garry Kasparov, it took me almost two decades before I could look at these games. Um, it was actually that traumatic. Beating the world champion, it's very different from beating all the contenders on the way to the match. It's like climbing Mount Everest. 
The difference between tournament and uh, world championship match is that obviously you only play one person. You're trying to find some weakness either in their personality or their psychology. It's a Darwinian e experience. Seeing the same guy day after day or in their case week after week, month after month, it's a different tension. Any two chess players playing a game are trying to draw each other into their weakest areas. You cannot be nice to your opponents. Every strategy which can destabilize your opponent is a good one. The winner of the match, it's, it's decided by, I think, by two factors. One is how soon you can learn about your opponents and from your mistakes and to adjust. And second is how strong you are to stay calm under pressure. In July 1978, Karpov and Korchnoi arrived in Baguio City in the Philippines. President Marcos, a keen chess player, and his wife Imelda were sponsors of the match. The prize fund was over half a million US dollars, with the winner earning $350,000. In comparison, the men's tennis champion at Wimbledon that same month was taking away a mere 19,000 pounds. The scene was set for the most remarkable World Chess Championship ever. The excitement about the match and the publicity was very much connected to the fact that Corso was a defector and Carpo was a darling of the system. You had a match staged in the Philippines with this incredibly dubious regime, the Marcos regime, who was sponsoring it. The uh, proclamation of martial law is not a military takeover. It was just mad. On to the Philippines, to the city of Baguio, 240 kilometers south of Manila. It's become a familiar dateline for chess fans because the world champion, Anatoly Karpov, is defending his title here against the challenger, Viktor Korchnoi. It has proved to be a dramatic encounter with endless disputes and wrangles about flags, thought waves, mirrored glasses, and even tubs of yogurt. The setting is a brand new convention center in Baguio, built to accommodate up to a thousand people. And the Filipino government spared no cost or effort to get everything right. Once, hundreds of school children were crowded into the auditorium and told to breathe heavily, just to simulate the presence of a large audience. The Soviets wanted to keep their Soviet World Championship title, and it was extremely important. Failure was no longer an option. I mean, they had already lost the world title once to an American. Losing it then to a Soviet defector. Um... A defector? A criminal? Run away with that? No, 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 no. That would be intolerable, unacceptable. If we can't beat them, kill them. <laughs> Before the match had even started, the Soviets fired the first shot in the propaganda war. They protested that even though Viktor Korchnoi had settled in Switzerland, he was not allowed to play under the Swiss national flag, as his illegal defection from Russia had made him stateless. A flag is a symbol, and the battle of the flags was itself symbolic. The Swiss flag, which adorned his team's cars, was ruled out by an international chess jury. Korchnoi wasn't too dismayed, though. He had scored a point by offering to use a white flag saying stateless or a Soviet flag with the words, I escaped, on it. We were discussing having a sort of pirate flag or some Jolly Roger or what have you, but it didn't really matter what the flag was. The point of the dispute as with most things in the, in the Soviet system, was it was a means to demonstrate their power. Florencio Campomanis, the match organizer, knew to become FIDE president, he would need the Soviet Union and the, uh, the Soviet bloc uh, behind him. We called him Carpomanis, not Campomanis, mister. Uh, I think that you can buy him. You can buy him. Karpov had a cocktail party given in his honor on the eve of the championship by the Soviet ambassador. And at President Ferdinand Marcos of the Philippines headed an impressive guest list. It must all have reinforced Korchnoi's feeling that the establishment was closing ranks against him. 
course they knew that he would be facing a KGB control operation. We knew there were going to be a lot of KGB people around. Victor taught us to recognize them. They were rather like the description of the hippopotamus. Difficult to describe, but you'll know one when you see it. And uh, the KGB agents in the hotel lobby were very much the same. There was excitement in the air when July the 18th finally arrived. The first game in a championship carrying the priceless prestige of the world crown. Korchnoi started with the white pieces, giving him the initiative. But both men played with caution, determined to avoid an opening defeat at all costs. And the game ended in a tame draw after only 18 moves. No one could have predicted that the match would still be continuing into October, causing the Danish grandmaster Bent Larsen to send both players a record of Filipino Christmas carols. Whilst the opening games themselves were tame encounters, the Soviets decided to ignite the off-the-board controversies by requesting that Korchnoi's expensive $1,300 chair from Sweden be inspected for radio waves in case they were interfering with Karpov's thoughts. In response, Korchnoi's delegation complained about the yogurt that was being made by Karpov's chef. During the game, Karpov was getting some sort of yogurt, and Korchnoi complains that the color of yogurt hints to Karpov what kind of move to make. And then the chief arbiter, Lotus Schmidt, he ordered to bring the yogurt at the same time, at the same color. This wasn't about coded messages at all, that this was about there was some kind of stimulant in the, in the yogurt which, which just speeded up his metabolism. At game five, Korchnoi adjourned. We analysed the position all night, winning in every variation. A couple of hours before the game resumed, Korchnoi went to sleep, and Michael Steen and I left his room in the Pines Hotel, and we saw the local policeman looking at the adjourned position. And their very first move was a move we hadn't even looked at, we hadn't even considered it. And I said to Michael, do you think we should go and wake Victor up? And these coppers have found a move that we didn't think of. And he said, nah, you know, it's, it's bad to be rubbish now. We've looked at everything in port. So, we don't tell Victor. The game resumes. Karpov, of course, has played the move of the policeman. And it turns out to be much stronger than we thought. And Victor took so long working out how to win that he missed a false mate with checks and eventually drew the game. The first part of the match, it was very tough and we were very, very close. After seven consecutive draws, at the start of game eight, Karpov ignored Korchnoi's outstretched hand, refusing to start the game with the customary handshake. It was the first time this had happened during any World Championship match. Korchnoi insulted Tal and another one from my team. Karpov, as a citizen of this country, he insulted the Soviet Union and the person Mr. Karpov as a citizen of the Soviet Union. Heavily insulted. And that's after this, I, I said to myself, okay, this is probably the moment. The score is level. And then by game eight, you suddenly decide not to shake your opponent's hand. No, no you don't do that. It's just an insult. Victor Korchnoi plays much worse when he's angry. And before the last game, the Soviets produced this masterstroke that really upset him, which was uh, refusing to shake hands. I'm going to refuse your hand. It's going to piss you off. At that point, the referee should have stepped in, because this was just a gross breach of etiquette. Even Korchner, with all his knowledge of KGB and the, and, and the Soviets, uh, he still didn't believe they would do that. Any way Karpov could arrange things that would put his opponents off, you know, knock him around, slap him around, he was not above availing himself of those opportunities. After Karpov's first win in Game 8, the Soviets threw a party to celebrate. The official match organizer, Florencio Campomanes, also attended and toasted Karpov's victory with champagne. And to five more. And more. Yeah. <laughs> Korchnoi's delegation informed the Soviets that they were happy for handshakes not to take place anymore, as it would save Korchnoi the bother of washing his hands afterwards. When the Soviet delegation rebuked them for insulting Karpov, Ray Keen sent Bacharinsky a large cigar as a peace offering. The cigar was returned to a day later with a bar of soap.
When Courtland came out of Game 8, he said, I sensed that Karpov had some bombshell idea in the open Lopez. We did not find a Knight G5. It's an amazing idea. It's absolutely fantastic. And um, we were just shocked. We thought, what the hell is going on? From game 10 to 20, of course, Dan Karpov was better. He would exploit Coach Noy's big weakness, which was time trouble, his handling of the clock. Vict was losing games which he was pressing to win. Um, Karpov was holding on, then hitting him with counter punches, sort of late in the game when Vict was getting tired. He wasn't able to put the ball in the back of the net, and, uh, and sometimes <laughs> the ball was going in his own net. Game 13 and 14, Kochnoi lost two games. And this was even ridiculous because in one game he was doing great the whole time. And at the very last move, he still has a draw. These are moments you feel like killing yourself. When Kochnoi slumped in the middle, we thought, well, you know, it's all over. We're just sort of trying to cling on. Victor was clearly becoming very disturbed by the parapsychologist Dr. Zhuka. Another big talking point reached into the world of the paranormal with Korchnoi claiming his thoughts were being influenced by the brain waves of Dr. Vladimir Zukar. He would take a seat near the front of the stage and simply stare at Korchnoi without appearing to take any interest in the progress of the game itself. Zukar was there specifically with the intention of placing him uh, sort of in, in, in Korchnoi's eyesight and then waiting for Korchnoi to do the rest. Whatever Dr. Zukar's powers, Korchnoi was clearly upset and he called an impromptu and animated press conference to give yes. vent to his feelings. He plays with a sense of will of, of Zucker, and I play against Zucker. Korchnoi asked Zucker for psychological advice when he lived in Soviet Union. So here you see someone who knows you very well, some of your inner mysteries, inner problems, working for your enemy. He is disturbing me, and he is on the visual and the mental, psychological and hypnotic connection with the car, with Karpov, what is strictly prohibited by FIDE rules. The Korsnoy team decided on a very scientific method of countering Dr. Zhukov's powers. Petra sat behind him in the auditorium and poked him with a pencil. Most of the chess world probably just had a laugh at the antics. But uh, having gone through the cycle later, I can tell you that uh, this is deadly serious stuff. One does lose a sense of proportion regarding what's happening inside the cauldron and what's happening outside. But it's inevitable, because once you recognize chess is only a game, you've lost the match. <laughs> Every time Karpov won, his chef, because he had a personal chef in his entourage, baked him a cake with the final position on. And uh, when Karpov won game 17 from a, a lost position and uh, unleashed a sudden checkmating attack from nowhere with a couple of knights at the end, the first thing he did was eat the white king from the cake. In the spot committee was a telephone where permanently a grandmaster was sitting. If Leonid Brezhnev asked, what about the position? And how about our Anatoly? Of course, it's normal for any country who has the world champion to try to protect him. The question is, uh, with what means? Victor was aware that there was a possibility that his personal safety might be threatened, but it was something that didn't concern him. Although on one occasion, he was surrounded by bodyguards. It flashed across his mind that, well, you know, they could turn, they could be turned at any moment. Where he was careful about security wasn't physical security, but security of information. We were not allowed to analyze in the hotel room. He was convinced that our rooms would be bugged. In the second half of the match, I was appointed not just chief second, but also the head of the delegation, which had been Petra Lerverick. There was a sort of period when Victor was sort of gradually trying to get some kind of foothold into the match, um, struggling for long periods, but always surviving. It's 
long as Korchnoi doesn't lose, he will continue putting this psychological pressure to put that final nail in the coffin. With Korchnoi unable to get himself back into the match and score wins, his delegation decided to counter the negative energies of the parapsychologist Dr. Zukar. If there is any negative influence from the part of Zukar, the meditation that Victor is doing will uh, block that. The Ananda Mahoga thing with um, these orange robe mystics levitating for victory for Korchnoi, that was a total shock. The scandal was all the greater because the gurus were on bail, appealing after being convicted of the attempted murder of an Indian diplomat. An Indian boy like me would have been mystified by this stuff. I mean, you would think, are they adults or what is this? We had all these um, yoga lessons and we were standing on our heads and doing all sorts of odd things. I thought that this was quite funny. People who had absolutely nothing to do with chess. But he was probably right to do something like that because the Soviets got confused. They couldn't understand something like that. My friends come to the playing hall, the security search them and ask their identification cards. So it's, a, it's very strange. It's, it's kind of a psychological pressure all the time. And, and the, the organizers, Kampamanis, is guilty. What the Soviets did was almost self-defeating because if you wanted Victor to play at his very, very best, make him angry. And boy, did they make him angry. They use um, blackmail, they use uh, all, all kind of pressure onto the, well, onto the organizers, onto the jury. That uh, It's very difficult to, well, to fight with them. Despite the Korchnoi delegation's best efforts to counter the Soviet's gamesmanship, Karpov won game 27 when Korchnoi blundered in time trouble thereby taking a 5-2 lead in the match. Match is virtually over. I mean, it's done. All Karpov needs is one win. Victor needs four. The Soviets thought they'd won the match, so they agreed to withdraw Zuhar. Karpov relaxed early, and then he thought, I'm 5-2 ahead, I'm 20 years younger. And Victor Stage is one of the greatest, most remarkable comebacks in the history of chess. I have uh, never come back from a three-point deficit. I can't recall anyone else who comes back from a three-point deficit. The turning point came when there was an adjourned rook and pawn ending. I remember Victor going to the game not knowing what his first move was going to be because the logical first move led to a draw. So at the board, he played something else which was one of our suboptimal lines, deliberately, and this is Victor the Gambler, just to confuse Karpov. And he succeeded, and he won the game. Then I sensed something was changing at that point. I don't know what happened. I had some, maybe psychological collapse. And then Korshina won two games, almost in a row. And then uh, I had to suffer a lot. And another thing which was depressing for me in the uh, Philippines, they have tradition to give women names to typhoons from A to Z. And so, to the end of this match, the second alphabet was finishing. <laughs> and so it was very depressing. He had sleeping problems. In fact, what he claims is that this guy, Sukar, who was supposed to be a parapsychologist, was there to, to help him to sleep. Karpov's stamina was not strong enough, so he, just, he always, at the end of the day, he always feel that he was, he was losing uh, his steam. You know, hey, you know, we're starting to win. Why are we starting to win? He's obviously very tired. Right, let's go into long end games and see if we can win them. And we did. Kochnoi highlighted one of Karpov's biggest weaknesses. At the moment when decisive action is called for, he is very hesitant. Amazingly, at the end, Korchun uh, was back. We thought Karpov w was on the verge of cracking. When Korchnoi drew level at five wins each, the storms in Baguio were nothing compared to those brewing in Moscow. The unthinkable, losing the world title to a Soviet defector, was almost becoming the probable. In Moscow was a Congress of Komsomol, Komsomol's youth organization, and the secretary said in his speech, 
Now it's five to five. But, comrades, we are sure that victory will be on our side, on the Soviet side. And the big applause of the audience. This was incredible. I, we were all, all in this moment. The Czechoslovakia was exactly for Korchnoi, not for Karpov. Vitaly Sevastyanov, famous Russian cosmonaut, who was president of Soviet Chess Federation, he insisted I take time out, and then we went to Manila, and they had World Championship basketball. And so I visited the final match. It was an extremely interesting match. Soviet Union is leading the whole match and they are losing on the last seconds to Yugoslavia. Can you imagine Karpov thinking that it's going to happen to me? Our guys are losing, I'm going back and losing my final game. Okay. Good luck to you. Okay, thank you. Don't get so close. Come on, man. His main second, Yuri Balashov, wrote after the match that we knew that somebody was written already a report to TGB that is something not good around Karpov. And we understood that we will be punished in the Soviet Union, he writes. They knew how to punish. They knew how to punish. For Karpov returning back to the Soviet Union after losing to Korshnoi, um, that would be quite a challenge. So Korshnoi has now pulled back from 5-2 down to 5 each. And he's won three of the last four games. And various things happened at this point. One was that the president of the World Chess Federation, Dr. Max Erver, came to me and said, let's just call the match off, shall we? We'll call it a draw and we'll have another match next year. My first thought was, if I suggest this to Korchnoi, and he says, Yes, he may have thrown away his chance of winning the match because we just won three in a row, essentially. But if he says no, when he plays the next game, he may wish that he'd agreed to do it and it may affect his play. So the first dilemma is, do I tell Korchnoi or do I just take the decision myself as head of delegation? My second thought was, what is the world going to say when it's got to a most exciting point? And we call it off. So I said to Irvin, no. I said, we're not going to do that. And I'm not even going to tell Korchnoi. Let's forget that you suggested it. So I think it was an illegitimate suggestion. In Baguio, there was a referee, Lothar Schmidt. He was very, very careful. Because he wants to be always referee. And suddenly, he has some reason that he said, no, I cannot be there for the last game. And he really left Baguio. He was afraid what happens when Korchnoi would suddenly win this match. We knew that the Soviets were going to do something and the degree of pressure and influence they brought to bear reached its zenith prior to that 30 second game. Philip was the second referee in Baguio and I think that he was collaborating with the Russian he was also main referee during the last game in Baguio. This I did not like. The Soviets immediately broke all their um, agreements about uh, having Dr. Zukhar near the front row. Philip should not allow Zukhar that he could suddenly be in uh, first uh, rank or two. He has not done it. I think he was paid for it. They also insisted that we kick the Ananda Marga people who were supporting Korchnoi out of town. We have been keeping track of the activities of Ananda Marga, Michael Dwyer and Victoria Shepherd, convicted felons out on bail. We have reported the presence and the recent activities of Dwyer and Shepherd to the PCINP provincial commander in Benguet province. Personally, I wasn't too sorry to see them kicked out. But on the other hand, I didn't want Korchnoi to feel that he was being disadvantaged by having them kicked out. Victor didn't understand why the, these meditating people weren't there in the morning. I sensed this was a desperate last ditch attempt from all sides. Irva suggested we stop the match, Russians putting Zukar back, 
an Andamaga being threatened with being removed from town. But I thought, hey guys, this implies that we're actually going to win on the chessboard. Krishnap saw my condition and my form, and then uh, he decided that he must uh, play for a win, it doesn't matter, white or black. After Manila, I was ready for a big fight. Now, Victor was to win with the black pieces, which is a real no-no at the world's top level. You don't have to try to win. Carver will collapse because he has been collapsing. He had to play for a quiet position, maybe slightly worse, but not to give Carver a chance. Nobody was going to say to him, Oh, just steady old chap. Just, just take it easy for a game, you'll be fine. I mean, nobody was going to play that to Victor. Here's Anatoly with the white pieces, game 32. What the hell just happened? How did Korchnoi manage to tie this match? What? You're going to play that ridiculous defense against me? Korchnoi played the opening which he never played against me. It's clear Korchnoi played for win, but I was glad that it would be a complicated game. And probably I would not uh, carry tension for two, three, four, or five more games. Playing this slightly risky opening in this crunch game, it says everything about Victor. It was a dumb thing to do, but it just, you know, if you're playing an exhausted opponent who's run out of ideas, to give them a totally fresh field of combat is a strategic and psychological blunder. Well, Victor just walked into the worst uppercut ever. Michael suggested the idea of the move C5 in the Pitts defense and I wasn't happy with this at all because the way Michael wanted to play it he wanted to put the black queen's bishop on b7 and it looks like it's biting into granite on d5 Yasha Murray was dead against this and I was dead against this but I was the expert on the Pitts defense everybody thought it was my idea it was excellent game this last game excellent game on the chess level. There are so many things that you can, you can get wrong. Just one false move and you're dead. I was so nervous, I couldn't watch the game. Korchnoi wins. <sighs> oh my God. We're happy to meet you on the occasion of the finish of the World Chess Championship match. World Champion Anatoly Karpov. The Soviets celebrated more out of relief than happiness. Had Korchnoi won, the KGB's response to this event was unknown. I think if Korchnoi had won the championship, uh, the Soviets would have done everything they possibly could to get it back again. What would have happened if Korchnoi had won? Uh, Korchnoi claims that he would have been shot. He may have saved his own life by not winning that, 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 that game. Because had he won, we have it on the authority of Mikhail Tal, who was one of Karpov's seconds. Tal said, Victor, had you won that match, you were a marked man. I think that having him assassinated by the KGB would have made it rather obvious where the assassination had come from. That KGB involved, you know, so uh, everything was possible in that time. Everything was possible. Game 32 was a game too far for Victor Korchnoi. Karpov had outplayed him in an unfamiliar opening system and shown the instinct of a true champion. Credit should be given to Karpov that, that he didn't crack under pressure. Many people would have. Even if I don't, I did not like it, especially in that time, Karpov was better. After the huge disappointment of losing the match, Korchnoi refused to sign the score sheet for the last game. He then criticized his head of delegation, Ray Keane, accusing him of spending too much time with his Soviet counterpart Baturinsky and too much time in the press centre preparing his forthcoming book on the match. And then the whole thing turned to ratchet. Petra took it quite philosophically, but Korchnoi, in my opinion wrongly, boycotted the closing ceremony. We weren't interested in the protocol, we weren't interested in anything, we just wanted to get out. He left me to represent him, which I tried to do with as much dignity as I could muster. Certainly I broke off the team at that point. Could he have won if it was just a fair match? Who knows? He never got that. Philip, half an hour later, he was throwing all dirties on Korchner. Uh, traitor, 
he betrayed, you know, he was cheating. There was this deep feeling of, of anger that the Soviets were allowed to get away with what they got away with. I've always admired Kochnoi for the punishment he took in that match. All the family issues and all the other issues that came into these matches, um, it would have uh, hurt a weaker man. I was very disappointed when he finally lost. And I remember receiving this Soviet chess newspaper in the post with this incredible photo of Karpov receiving the Order of Lenin from Brezhnev. As soon as Korchnoi returned to competitive chess, the Battle of Bagyo was behind him. As a survivor of the Siege of Leningrad, he learned to think about the next day, not the last one. Two days after he was the best, Korchnoi gave a simultaneous exhibition in Hong Kong. On the next day, he flew from Hong Kong to Buenos Aires, was the chess Olympiad, to play for Switzerland. And I met him there. And he looked uh, not as unhappy man, not at all, not at all, because he could play chess. When he saw a chess board, everything changed. He becomes the best player of Olympia, scoring plus eight on the first board there, and he wins the chess Oscar 1978 in spite of losing this match. He was still in chess, he was still in business. Incredibly. Viktor Korchnoi was again going to win the right to challenge Anatoly Karpov for the world chess title at Murano in 1981 at the age of 50. Whether it be in 74, in 78, in 81, he had become three times the challenger. Viktor Korchnoi did what he wanted on the chessboard. He said what he wanted off the chessboard. He was completely his own man. So dynamic, so aggressive. I would say even arrogant, in a good sense of this word, in his 50s and 60s and even 70s. Korchnoi's stunning results continued even into his 80s. His victory at Gibraltar in 2011 over world championship candidate Fabiano Caruana, nearly 60 years his junior, caused a sensation in the chess world. When I looked at the quality of the game, and it's amazing, he was very happy. I remember he came to me and said, you know, I finished my notation with the game. Would you like to read it? And then he like giggled like, did you like it or not? Yeah. Question and myself. I had problems uh, playing tournaments, but then we started to play tournaments. And once, uh, I can say, uh, organizers and players were astonished because we played the uh, bridge together, like many years ago in Leningrad or in Moscow. In Brussels, uh, 87, they played the game, and it was a dead draw, but, but Karpov apparently didn't want to, uh, to agree to a draw. He had maybe a slight edge, but there was nothing going on there. Some moment, Kutzner touched his king, and that was fatal. He couldn't touch the king. And he took his king, and uh, he threw it through the playing hall. <laughs> that was his way of resigning. And then Kochner played for my team, and he couldn't get visa to the Soviet Union. Consul said he doesn't believe that Kochner can be in my team. I called Consul and I said, Kochner is correct. He's in my team and we play in Kazan. Could you give visa? Kochner was very surprised that I called to our embassy and to, to, to give him a chance to, to receive visa. And after this, our relations started even, to be even better. And so he played, I think, three seasons for my team. So did you ever discuss the 1978 World Championship? No, 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 no. <laughs> for sure not. <laughs> I knew it wouldn't be a nice memory for him, so I tried to, uh, to tease him. <laughs> Following a stroke and heart complications, Victor Korchnoi received treatment in a Swiss clinic his uncompromising will to fight on the chessboard now became his battle in everyday life. We went to visit Victor in the hospital, and Victor was in very bad condition. But then we put chessboard, and his eyes focused, and we kind of played the game. I started showing him something, and he said, no, let's play. And you know, 
his eyes focused and he started making excellent moves. And uh, the game was going to end in a draw and he put a last trap and he thought he is winning and said Auf Wiedersehen in German. The day Victor died, I just uh, lost his, his greatest figure ever. He told us, guys, all of you have potential to become world champions. I reached my peak at 47 in Baguio. And these words I remember forever. He would be probably remembered more than other some world champions. Korchner's legacy in chess is, uh, is multifaceted. People loved Korchner. People, especially chess people, this is really one of the all-time great. Victor was just this superhuman character. He was a hero in the classic sense of the word. He was a fighter. Petra did something very gracious. So she had a special piece of jewelry with number 13. It's just in with all the diamonds. She, she did it for Baggio. Uh, for Korshner's victory. She expected him to be the certain world champion. And she gave it to my mother. So this is for you because Gary will be certain world champion. And my mother still keeps it. It's like a sign of great honor. After all these years, um, many of the unkind things he said about me, uh, to my face, he never, he never, Victor would never say it behind your back. Some of the fondest things I remember of him. When Victor left the Soviet Union, he knew that he was leaving behind his wife and son. They escaped eventually, but it wasn't guaranteed. I'm not sure you can do this, but he did it. He would literally give up all of his possessions and relationships for chess. Nobody played in chess history like Gorshnoi. Uh, it's very difficult to play the way how he played. Sometimes I say, now, Blasti, come. You like chess, I like it, but now you have to fight like Victor. He is a symbol of somebody who tried to fight alone against of such a monster, which was the Soviet Union. Victor's legacy as an individual was defined by his fight against a system, but that system no longer exists. And so, in a sense, um, there's a danger his legacy will be lost, and I don't think it should be because uh, his was a wonderful example. After the epic Karpov and Korchnoi chess struggles were over and he had retired from chess, Karpov became a member of Vladimir Putin's government. I always view Karpov as a, not as a just, you know, a personal enemy, but more like a tool of the system. He had a tendency to use the, the rules, the FIDE rules, to his advantage. No matter what change was made over since 1977 to 1997, you always find one beneficiary. It was Anatoly really Karpov. It was more important keeping the privilege that he had gotten, rather than worrying about whether the world would look on it kindly or not. And in that sense, he's an extreme, I don't know, what's the word, cynic or pragmatist. When I played him in 1992, he came along with this parapsychologist just sitting in the front row, staring at me. Those underhand tactics are part of the Karpov armory. I think he's one of the greatest ever. Definitely the strongest player of the world for 10 years. Not only did he defend his title twice against Korchnoi, but also he had these extraordinary matches against Kasparov in the 1980s. As world champion, he was regal and pervious. Then he lost the world championship to uh, Garry Kasparov. And in the world of chess, it's often stated, he regained his humanity. He becomes uh, less fanatic. I think it's the same as Kasparov. He becomes more sociable. As a person, I've grown to like Karpov immensely. I think time and certain distance from my own matches with him have put things in a certain perspective. He's actually a very witty, charming person with unbelievably good company. Anatoly, as the world champion, received enormous benefits that he happily, happily, happily accepted. 
later he would reflect and say, oh, well, I was being an ass, wasn't I? <laughs> you know, like, but he could never, ever say that in his first role. Kasparov also retired from competitive chess in 2005, but continued to be an outspoken critic of Russia's democracy. In 2007, Kasparov was arrested and imprisoned after an anti-Kremlin demonstration in Moscow. So many people that I treated as friends, they didn't even call my mother, and Karpov showed up in jail. I wanted to, to see in which condition he is, but they didn't allow me. I tried to bring this magazine, 64, actually, the, the prison guard brought it to me and said, it's, it's, it, it's from Karpov. I said, oh, come on, from Karpov. <laughs> he said, no, Karpov brought it to you. I know that many police officers, they play chess. They have chess sets and chess clocks. And so if they would allow me to enter and that we could play, so it would be a fantastic news for all TVs in the world. And so they missed it. I don't know why he did it. It's this, maybe some kind of uh, solidarity with what Spassky called the smallest trade union in the world, the world of world champions. Um, but he did show up which had a very deep and profound effect on me. The Korchnoi versus Karpov match highlighted the bitter internal struggle of a Soviet system trying desperately to cling to power against the emerging perestroika movement. It was not just a fight between two individuals that was so different in everything, but it also was a political challenge. It's a political challenge of a rebel against the system. He failed, but he showed the vulnerability of the system. It was not black and white. They were, they are shades of colors, you know. And Kochno was not an angel at all. And Karpov was not a monstrous figure at all. All of them were heroes and all villains. But the, the definitely hero was the KGB because the main goal, uh, namely to keep the world title in the Soviet Union, was done. The Karpov versus Korchnoi matches were the last hurrah of the KGB. The emergence of Garry Kasparov's generation would see the KGB's power over chess weaken. The Soviet authorities blocked us from shaking hands with the defectors. And then when I was forced to play Korshnoi, I was told by a KGB guy in the team, that's, you remember the rule, I said, basically, a few. You want me to play? I shake his hand. I had tremendous respect for the man, so it was my first rebellion. The clock was finally running out for the old guard of Baturinsky and his Cold War chessmen. In 1991, I have seen him in Moscow, and he was really very shabby, and he was drunk, and he had no job anymore by KGB. He was in bad shape later on when communism fell. He didn't have much money left, and Karpov bought his library. After Baturinsky died in 2002, Korchnoi started to speak with big respect. He liked Baturinsky. He had respect for him as a professional. Two make from KGB people, uh, people demons. I don't think it's right. They were the same people with uh, drinking problems, women problems, everything problems, and everything only working for this organization. The percent of the KGB who asked for political asylum in the West are higher than any, any other uh, pro pro profession because they could uh, uh, go regularly to the West and they could uh, see with own eyes what is different. That world is gone forever. It'll be a long time before a chess match is seen as a proxy for geopolitical agendas. Now what we have is youngsters just having a fun game of chess. In Baguio, it's 32 games. But look at the World Championship now, it's 12 games, it's nothing. It's not a patch on those guys in the 70s. The 70s and the 80s, that era is special and it will never come back. <laughs>